Hello, and welcome to the Addicts Anonymous podcast. I'm your host, Jim R. Today's episode 188, and we're going to be interviewing Kelly. How are you doing, Kelly? Jim, I'm just fine, man. Thank you for having me on. And um, how are you? I'm doing well. I'm excited to do this. I'm excited. Same here. All right, man. Let's dive in. So um, kind of start the episode off. Everyone's saying if you've heard a few. Tell me about your childhood and growing up. Okay, sounds good. Well, I... Um... I grew up just north of Toronto. So, I mean, I'm from Ontario. I'm a Canadian, full disclosure. So I grew up in a, you know, small-ish community. And I, I guess you would say I had a, you know, a fairly um, stereotypical family or a normal family where I have, you know, two, two great parents. I have a, an older sister and my, you know, my dad worked, my mom worked part-time and they did the best they absolutely could for us, you know, and we had, I'd say, you know, let's call it an upper middle class lifestyle. So we never wanted for anything. Um, I never, we didn't have to struggle because of the work that my parents did. I'm so grateful for everything they did for us. And in fact, um, that they continue to do for us throughout our, throughout our childhood and our adult years, even, especially in my addiction, my parents helped me out so much. So, we, you know, there was daily drinking in the house as well. My dad was a heavy drinker. He passed away about five years ago, not, not from the alcohol, but there, there was, you know, that's not my, I guess not my job to pronounce him as a, as an alcoholic or whatever it is, yeah. but it definitely affected the family dynamic that he was a heavy drinker and, you know, caused a lot of tension, a lot of friction. Now that you've learned a little bit about it, do you think he was drinking alcoholically or was it just a sign of the times, like come home, work hard, have your drink, eat your dinner? Or do you think he was addicted, like he needed it? Yeah, I, 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 I think he was addicted. Yeah, I think he was addicted, knowing what I know, feeling how I feel about alcohol, me being an alcoholic as well. I, I just see the symptoms of the, you know, I didn't want to drink that much, but I drank that much. I didn't want to, you know, it was a Sunday afternoon and I didn't want to pass out in the, in the living room, but it happened anyway, sort of losing control once I have a couple of drinks and realizing that it's, you know, my family, my family's suffering, my job is suffering, but I'm going to do it anyway, even though it doesn't make any sense. So mm. yeah, that's, that's what I saw, you know, realizing, of course, that, again, he did the best he could with what he was, with what he was dealing with, right? So that's all, that's, all a parent can do is their best. You got it, man. You know, recovery's taught me all, all about that, that people are, people are doing their best, no matter what, uh, what, what, what they're actually currently up to, what stage of life they're at, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So do you, can you think back to anything that would show like early signs of that you were going to have addiction issues leading into adulthood? You know, I think, honestly, I think my first, and I've been thinking about this recently, my first ad addictive behavior came with food. Mm -hmm, me too. It, yep. Yeah. Okay. You can relate to that then. And I can just remember being younger, you know, coming home from school and finding comfort in like jamming a bunch of toast in my mouth like four pieces of toast before we had dinner and just and just it giving me that feeling of satisfaction that I guess I was looking for but didn't really know I was looking for so that was kind of the first sign you know I had some obsessive behaviors as well where I was overweight when I was a kid and I started really, really, really obsessing about that and becoming, you know, super fearful that people were judging me and looking at me and, and not feeling, you know, good enough or as good as my peers. So, you know, the overeating, which obviously, you know, in a lot of cases leads to being overweight, I think was kind of the beginning of my addictive behaviors before I even got into the alcohol and the cocaine and the crack. Yeah. My, uh, my first foray into being in an attic was chips ahoy. You ate okay. them, you got a rush of sugar, made you feel a little bit better. Okay. Well, if I had, you know, five cookies, what happens if I have 10? <laughs> what mm -hmm. happens if I have 15 and you just kept going from there? I, I hear you, man. Mine was white bread. Not, not yeah. too different than it's still some type of cookie, processed, man. uh, what do you call it product that yeah i mean bread's a carbohydrate so it gives you that dopamine release kind of yeah 
Absolutely, man. So that's, you know, that was the first thing I did because, you know, I didn't, <laughs> maybe, maybe if I knew I could drink and get a, give it a different effect when I was, you know, 12 years old or 10 years old, I may have done that. But this was my first, my first uh, sort of escape. It gave me something that I was looking for. It gave me a feeling of, of being satisfied, I guess. Yeah. And, you know, getting, getting into, of course, um, shortly after I entered high school, like in ninth grade, I started drinking and that gave me something that I, I needed, though I didn't know I needed it. You know, when I got into high school, I was kind of separated from all my friends in, in, in grade school. What do you mean um, you needed it? I needed it because I, it, it gave me something. It gave me uh, confidence and confidence was something I lacked. When I got into high school, you know, a lot of new people and when I think back now, it was me. I, I I always needed your approval. I needed the approval of people, and I didn't see myself as worthy of that as I was. So when I found alcohol, I remember drinking for the first time at a Halloween party back in 1987. As a matter of fact, um, I was 14, and I just remember drinking and and just feeling like I could be a part of a part of life, a part of the fun, a part of the party, and not feel self conscious about the person I was when I wasn't drinking, I didn't feel worthy. You know, um, I was shorter than all my friends. I was overweight. I didn't see myself as an attractive person. I didn't feel myself worthy of a girlfriend. I just felt separated from my peers. Drinking alcohol allowed me from what I saw to gain the approval of my peers. Cause I would do things that were funny and people would laugh at me. And, I, and that's, that's exactly what I needed. And I did, that was something I found I'm like, okay, th this is what I've been looking for. Yeah, we've got a lot in common. I guess mm -hmm. it goes hand in hand with being heavy and having self image issues and body issues. Yeah, I definitely I, felt. I, I agree. You just felt like you always, even though nobody, it, it wasn't like that. You always felt like you had eyes on you. Sure. Yeah. You know, Absolutely. you felt like someone was always looking at you, but they weren't. No, I know that now. <laughs> it was just a mental thing. Yeah, no, same thing with me. I wish I, if good old fashioned saying, if I only knew then what I know now. Pardon me? I said a good old fashioned saying, if I only knew then what I know now. I, I, I couldn't agree more, man. I couldn't agree more. Yeah. So uh, how was your social life at school and stuff? So my social life was great. I mean, I had a lot of friends, to be honest with you, because I was, you know, I was, you know, I'm a pretty good guy. I was a funny guy. I was entertaining, whether or not I was drinking. Um, my group of friends were a, a bunch of great people. So I was social. It, it did a lot center around the partying because that's what, that's what I got into. Usually, you know, always, almost always on the weekends, um, almost every weekend during high school. But I, you know, you know, we would, you know, sometimes go camping on the weekend with a, with a group of great friends and we would do social things throughout the week, hang out at somebody's house. It wasn't always, you know, with alcohol. Um, but I did have a, a good social life. I can't complain about that at all. I didn't feel great. I mean, I didn't feel like I, I was exactly like the people I was socializing with because, you know, I see my buddy over here, he gets a girlfriend and they've been dating for a year. And then this guy over here, he's, he's, um, you know, going to get accepted into university and I wasn't doing that stuff. So I was there, but I still didn't feel a part of it though. I was being social. Gotcha. Yeah. Did you do good in school? I did great until I started to drink. Uh, ninth grade, I was an a, I was an A student all through you know my grade school, um, and I'm an A A student in my first semester of the ninth grade. But as soon as I found alcohol, and that when I did stuff like that, I got your approval. Um, my my schoolwork went completely. It took a backseat to to gaining the approval of my peers and the way I found that I could gain the approval of my peers. So I thought was through partying, being irresponsible, being a class clown, pissing off teachers. And that's what I did. And because of that, my grades completely suffered. So yeah. I went from being an A student to barely passing. How often would you be drinking? Did you say how often? Yeah, how often would you be drinking? It, it would be a weekly thing. So it, it didn't, for, for me, you know, I've heard of stories of people being, you know, 14, 15, 16 years old and drinking daily. That's, that's not, uh, that's not the case with me. So 
Friday, I, I really look forward to Friday night after school because hopefully I can go to somebody's house. Maybe their parents weren't away. Go sm- they were away, I'm saying. Maybe go smoke some cigarettes, drink some beer, get a little buzz on, and then continue on after that. And the same thing would be on uh, Saturday as well. Um, you know, I did start to go to school with alcohol at a certain point. I would, I would, and, 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 you know, people would, would talk about it. And I loved that. I thought it was great. Right. And I can remember, you know, falling off a, you know, a stool in my science lab because I was, I was so, so intoxicated at school. Right. And people would talk about that. And I go, this is the greatest thing ever. Right. Meanwhile, they're not, they're not hailing me as a hero. They're going, what is wrong with this guy? Yet. Yeah. I think, I think it's the greatest thing ever, you know? Yeah. We thought it was cool. I thought it was cool somehow, Jim. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Well, so that was, you know, so my, my, you know, high school stuff, I, of course, you know, I did graduate high school, uh, but it took me a year longer than it should have, but I got out of there, you know. So you got held back a year because of the drinking and stuff. You just were dove right down that bad in grades. Th- that's right. I just, I didn't, I didn't have the, the, um, the credits to get my diploma. So I just had to go back until I had enough uh, courses for them to actually hand, be able to hand me a high school diploma. Well, you made it. That's all that matters. Thanks, man. Yes, I did. Yeah. So what'd you do after you graduated high school? So I didn't really have a plan. Uh, I found that's a pattern throughout my life until, you know, let's just say the past 10 years. Um, I didn't have a plan. So I didn't have the grades to Quick get question. It. Go ahead. Before you graduated high school, did you do any other drugs or anything? Or was it just the alcohol at this point? I smoked a little weed. Okay. Yeah. Not a yep. Big deal. Okay. Yep. Love that because you know we would I used to, I would smoke just the right amount and we would laugh our buddies in the park and it was kind of cool and, and and I liked it I, I I enjoyed it back then right we we became not really my thing I, I it made me paranoid and stuff <laughs> later yeah. on I didn't I didn't really want it to to uh, ruin my alcohol buzz or my cocaine buzz so I kind of stayed away from it um, but so after you know finishing high school, I didn't really have. Um, a direction. I didn't know what I wanted to do with my life. I never thought about it. I was too busy trying to impress you to figure out what I wanted my future to look like. So um, I took what I thought was going to be a year off before I did something. It turned into four years where I was still living with my parents. I would work odd jobs. I loved golf back then. So I would work at golf courses in the summer and then try to find a job in the winter. You know, being from from uh, Ontario, we didn't have, we don't have golf in the winter. So I had to find something to do. And when I was 22, I actually managed to, you know, get my stuff together and go to college. So I did a three-year college program to do with tourism because, uh, you know, that kind of stemmed from my love of golf. But I also liked restaurants and I liked working with people, customers and, and you know, having conversations and making them laugh. And, and so that's why I did that. So I, I did, uh, and I did great in college, you know, because it was something that I said, okay, you know what, I want to do this, right? So I was, I was, I don't know, I wasn't an honor student, but I was very close to it. So I, I was very impressed and, you know, going from being a great student to a crappy student in high school to, to college and, and being a good student again, it gave me some, gave me some confidence, you know, that to realize that, yeah, I am a smart guy. Okay. As long as I keep my, as long as you, 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 you kind of, you're doing what you want to do, then, you know, you'll do well. Just kind of hold your shit together. Well, yeah, yeah. And, 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 you know, cause I chose to go to college. It wasn't like I was four. Yeah. Oh, hang on a second here. I think my mic changed. Sounds good to me. Okay. Never mind. Pardon me. Sorry about that. Um, so, yeah, so I did that until I was, uh, gosh, could I be 24 years old? And, um, you know, I'm drinking, mind you, alcoholically through this time. So I finished the, uh, the, you know, the college. I was working at a country club close to where I grew up, working, um, you know, managing the bar there. And I, I enjoyed the job. I had a great time. It was a private club. So, you know, get to know a lot of the members there, which was awesome. And there are a bunch of great people. I had great coworkers. And we, we had a lot of fun there. And I, I often... Um, reminisce about that place and and I and I and I miss that sort of uh, that environment um, from there I got a job in sales in 
in um, tech hardware sales through one of the members there. They were looking for an entry level salesperson. So I did that. And I, I thought, man, this is cool. And that was something that I added to my identity because you know, just being a, a bar manager or a bartender, it was, it was great. I, I had fun doing it, but I, I didn't want to only identify as that being a sales guy that kind of made me feel better about the person that I was. So I, I, uh, you know, took on that role. And from there I was recruited by a, a competitor, uh, from the U S a much bigger company. And then I, I went to work there, you know, but I'll tell you, even though, you know, I had a half decent job making some pretty good money, you know, in my twenties, I was always sad. You know, I used to always call it depression, but for me, and I found out in, in my recovery that I wasn't, I'm not a clinically depressed person. Like there doesn't seem to be anything chemically wrong with me. It was just the life that I chose to live. That was making me feel the way that I felt. It was the untreated addiction that I was suffering with. It wasn't in some sort of, you know, chemical imbalance. Um, so I carried that sadness and that, and that, you know, lots of self-pity with me for years. And so, you know, I, I, I got a, a great job in sales for this, this company that was much bigger. They treated me like gold. I, I think I was one of four Canadian employees where there were several hundred in the U S and in the meantime, though, I had finally found cocaine. Um, I didn't find, I didn't do my first line of cocaine until I was about 30, I think. And it came by, you know, just a, a, a couple of friends of mine. And I guess they've been doing it for a little bit. And I always think that they saw the way I was around alcohol because I turned in, you know, it turned out I was, you know, I would be a blackout drunk. Not every time, but very often I would be a blackout drunk, right? Where I, where I would have you know, two, three or four and, and not be able to shut it down when everyone else shut it down, I would keep going. So I think maybe they were kind of afraid to show me the cocaine, you know, to introduce me to it while they would do it casually. And, um, but, but, you know, I got a hold of some sunlight with them and I, and I did my first line of cocaine and I, 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 I got this feeling of absolute bliss, Jim, like this, you know, yeah. going from the, the, the depressant of the, uh, of the alcohol to this stimulating powder for me was just an absolute, you know, game changer. And I can remember that first little tiny line I did, you know, we went to the pub across the road from where we were and I was just talking pe to people all night and having a great time. And, and it, it was the greatest feeling that I could ever remember having. So and I'll get back into my, uh, my employment in a second, but, you know, from there, I, I went quickly from doing it casually with them once every couple of weeks to going to get it myself. And I was living, I was living South in uh, Toronto at the time while my friends were from a smaller town up North, but I would go get it from them and I would just go back to my apartment and I would lock the door and I would, I would do drugs by myself and drink by myself, you know, play online poker, do stuff like that, because that was just, that was my safe zone. I, and I didn't want to share it. I didn't want to have to, I didn't want to have to, you know, go in with somebody else and pool our money. I wanted to make sure every cent I invested in this product was going right back to me. So that's what I did. And I didn't also want to be judged. So that's what I, I ended up doing was, was starting to just use the cocaine on my own. Um, and so, you know, that, that progressed with me to isolating myself from my family, isolating myself from my friends, you know, like I said, I had a great job, but it started to not go great because, you know, my, you can't, you can't stay up all night doing cocaine and expect to be a good salesperson the next day or the next, um, you know, next week or what have you. So I was at home one afternoon and I was fairly new to living in downtown Toronto at this time. And I was having a couple of drinks and it was a Saturday afternoon or a Saturday late morning or something like that. I was just having a couple of beers by myself. And I thought I'd love to get a, some, some Coke right now. So I'm like, okay, well, let's just, let's just go, you know, right downtown and see what we can find. And that's the first time that, well, I found that, no, you can't just randomly go up to someone on the street and ask them for cocaine, hmm. you know, cause I, when I went to, you know, I went to what I considered, you know, a pretty seedy area. Um, and there were drugs there, but it just wasn't cocaine. So that's the first time someone ever sold me a rock of crack. And that's, that's sort of where my next, you know, 
dip in my in my life comes from because I started using crack by myself. It's not a very social drug in my experience. And, you know, all the problems I had with the alcohol and the cocaine, I was getting further and further and further in debt, you know, some using crack absolutely exacerbated that problem, you know, at least five times what it was, right? Because, I mean, if, if anyone has experienced um, you know, the obsession with smoking crack for me, it was, you know, I'd, I'd go take 40 bucks out of the bank and I would be at the, at the ATM five, six times the same night, just going, okay, just one, one bit more, one, one more, that's all I need. And then at the end of the night, you're putting a blank envelope in the, in the, uh, ATM and taking out money that doesn't exist, you know? Um, so that brought me down so much quicker than I was bringing myself down with the cocaine and the alcohol, just by the nature of the, the drug and the craving that goes along with it. And, um, you know, I was, like I said, I was working a, a great job. So I worked in the office in, in Toronto, the coworker, just two of us in the office, and he would often be traveling. So I had the office to myself sometimes, um, you know, and I can remember being there and I would, I would be using drugs in the afternoon in the office by myself, right. And being just so friggin' paranoid that the, you know, the FedEx, delivery person is going to come in while I'm doing a hit a crack in the server room or something like that. And, it, you know, people might call that paranoia, but that is a real fear because obviously yeah, I'm using yeah. drugs in the office. That's not something you should be doing. So, um, but yeah, so, I mean, that's, 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 that's where it got me as far as, you know, I was doing, I was, despite all my addictions, you know, I still had this, this great job, which could have, you know, I could have made a lot of money doing it. I could have gone far in the company, I'm sure. But I, I just, everything came after the, uh, the drugs and the alcohol. And, you know, I can remember one day, the debt that I'd gotten myself into, the depression I started to feel, that sadness, that self-pity that, oh my God, how am I ever going to get out of this? All the problems that I'd built up for myself, the isolation between me and my friends and my family, um, I decided while I was in the office, and I can still remember what I was looking at at my desk when I made this decision that I was going to kill myself that night because I don't know how I'm going to fix any of the of this shit um, that I've created for myself. And I remember, Jim, at that point, this sense of relief came over me. Something the thought was kind of like, oh, man, I don't have to do this again tomorrow because I'm not going to be here to have to experience this again, right? this, this friggin' turmoil that I'm feeling on the inside is going to be over. And so that night I went and I got all the money I could. I didn't have any, but I went and I forgot I had a credit card for an electronic or for a Best Buy, a Best Buy credit card, which I hadn't used in a long time, but I went and got it reactivated and went and got a couple of iPods at the time, bought those brand new, went to the pawn shop, sold them to them, um, bought as much, uh, you know, as many as much crack as I possibly could and I just sat down by the river in Toronto the Don River with my with with, with my knife and with my drugs going to finish them off and I was going to uh you know cut myself up and that would be the end of it in the meantime my family's looking for me because I had to move back in with my parents at this point because I couldn't take care of myself they actually came and said look we don't know what's going on with you but you need to come and see us because we're we're scared shitless and we don't know what you're doing um so you know I would go missing from time to time. Right. And so they, they were out looking for me as they often did. God bless them. My parents never, never gave up on me. My friends never gave up on me. And so I'm down by the river and I was, I ran out of, I ran out of drugs and, and, you know, I knew my buddy was looking for me, Alex. He lives in, lived in Toronto at the time. And I about, I can't remember six or seven in the morning when the sun was coming up and I hadn't, all I had done was, was cut my hand a little bit to see how sharp the knife was. I decided instead of doing that to go see my, my buddy, Alex, and maybe there's some, maybe there was something I could do. Right. And that was, uh, that was, that was the day I went to my first detox actually. That's good. And so, I mean, yeah, suicide is a real thing. A lot of people, they don't make it to the other side. You know what I mean? I know, man. Yeah. I know. And, and people who talk about, you know, I understand why people do it Be because, uh, you know, I was there. I understand how people feel just before. Yes. I mean, 
I know how I felt. I'm sure it's maybe a little different for everyone, but man, I, I can't, I can't judge anyone who does that. I'm so, I'm so grateful that I was, I wasn't able to go through with it, that I wimped out, but man, people who, who, who go through with it, man, my heart goes out to them and their families, obviously, but I, I know, I know what it's like. You have to be in a lot of pain to be there. Sure. Yeah. yeah. It's a, it's a you know, sense of hopelessness, right? Like there's nothing I can do to make my life better. So this is my only choice. Yeah. Yeah, man. But that was my, so that, you know, that was my first, my first trip to detox. And, and then shortly after that, I went to my first 21 day um, inpatient rehab center and it was, it was great. And, and they taught me everything they could teach me in, in three weeks. And they said, look, get out of here, go to some meetings, and, you know, get yourself a sponsor if you're going to work the 12 step program, because it was a 12 step based um, treatment center. And I said, okay, man, I'll do it. I did all the homework when I was in there, right? I was still a people pleaser, you know, back then. I kind of still am today, but that's all right. Um, so I did all the homework and I was taught with the class and my rehab center and all this, right? And I can remember asking one of the counselors the day I was graduating, I go, hey, Mike, I'm leaving today. How do you think I'm going to do? He goes, you're fucked. <laughs> he, was, he was joking. But he wasn't joking because he, he saw the kind of guy I was, right? And he was, he's a counselor. He's an addiction re recovery himself, right? He was a sober, sober addict at the time. And he could just see that I was just this guy who didn't really know what he was up against when it came to the addiction. And uh, sure enough, shortly after I left, I was right back at it. I was back, um, you know, disappearing from home, using drugs, drinking, doing whatever I could to make myself feel better. You know, I lost that job. I did lose that job because I was down in South Carolina, on a uh, all right, we had our North American sales conference every year, and um, so I was trying to stay sober, and I I wanted I wanted nothing but to stay sober, right? And you know, the a normal person would just go down there and go, you know what? Hey, I want to keep my job. It's a great job. I don't want to. I'm in a different country because you know I'm living in Canada. I'm in the U.S. Don't do anything stupid. Just have a good weekend and enjoy. But instead, I found out where I could score some drugs. I took a cab there and I got them and I disappeared and HR from that company was looking for me for a, a good day and a half. You know, my coworker from Toronto was there and, 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 and they were just absolutely, they, they knew because I had taken some time off of work before uh, a leave of absence to go to treatment. So they knew I had a problem. So they knew exactly okay. where I was, you know, but um, that is when they asked me to resign. Cause I eventually did come back of course, cause I ran out of money. I couldn't borrow any more from my credit card. That's probably the only reason I came back. It wasn't that I was feeling sorry for them because I had disappeared. It was that I was out of cash. So they, you know, they asked me to, to politely, you know, resign. And they were very, very good to me uh, because I'm sure they could have just fired my ass, which is what I deserved back then, you know. And, um, you know, I, I, I won't, you know, a lot of stuff happened between. So that was back in 2000 six 2007 I guess in the me you know so I get back home still stay with my parents right I'm in my early 30s at this point Jim I'm an adult man um, and I have to rely on my parents because I don't know how to take care of myself you know so I got a few odd jobs and went back to um, I went back to treatment again so I went for a, to a six-month treatment program because I just kept relapsing and I couldn't I couldn't really I wasn't really understanding recovery. I wasn't trying hard enough or whatever the case was. I certainly wasn't staying sober. And so I went to this place and about three months in, me and one of my, my uh, fellow clients, we decided that we were going to start using drugs while we were in the treatment center. So, so we did. And, you know, we decided, we, we discovered how to cheat. Well, he, he, he knew how to cheat on the P tests. And so he showed me. So we would, we would make sure that we were armed if we had to have a P test and we would just go use drugs. Um, and, uh, it was a very strange treatment center, whereas there was no staff there after five o'clock and there was no staff there on the weekends. And it was just eight or 10 men living together in this house, trying to recover. I found that kind of strange. Mind you, if I really wanted to stay sober, I know I could have stayed sober. I can't blame anyone but myself for that. Yeah. Um, but you know, one of, one of those days where I had, I had, I was in the treatment center and I was using drugs in the morning or in the afternoon, whatever the case was. And I, I didn't have any more money and, and, you know, but I had to have more cause I was coming down. And it was one of those things where I'm sure you can relate that I, I, I had to get more. It didn't yeah. matter what I did. So I had to steal, I had to steal 
in order to get it. So I actually robbed a woman um, out front of a grocery store to, you know, I, I snatched her purse. I mean, I was just, it was just the biggest scumbag move that you could think of. And I did that. And I was, I'm, not, I'm a terrible criminal, Jim, I'll be honest with you. And, you know, shortly after that, I was, I was, I was, I was actually chased by a group of, you know, kind hearted people who just wanted this woman to get her stuff back. I was chased. I'm on my mountain bike. And I decided to ditch my mountain bike and, and jump across a river, you know, jump in a river fully clothed in the middle of February in, in Ontario, freezing cold. And I'm swimming across this river. Now my clothes are absolutely soaking wet and I'm freezing. And I just, I was just, what is going on here? What is, what has happened to your <laughs> life? You know, not, not worried about the poor woman I just robbed, but worried about like, okay, how, how, how do I convert this into me getting high right now? And I, I never did, you know, and I, I, because I, 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 everything I'd stolen from her, I dropped somewhere. I don't know what happened. So I, was I'm like, I'm defeated. So I stole a bike from uh, beside this crack house. And I just was riding it down the street, waiting for the police to come. And sure enough, they did. They arrested me. And remember the cop saying to me while I was in, in, in handcuffs in the back of the car. And he said, so he goes, you're in a drug rehab center. I said, yeah. He goes, but you're, you're smoking crack. I don't know if it confused him or I, obviously he doesn't, you know, I'm like, yeah, I know it doesn't make any sense, but yes, that's, that's what I'm doing. Right. And I was just, um, it, just, just awful memories. Right. So of course I was asked to leave that place. And, you know, I did go to a third rehab center after I dealt with everything. Um, I was homeless for a while. I was living in a shelter in the same area. And, you know, part of me, Jim was kind of like, geez, I'm living in this shelter. I have no responsibilities. I don't have to report to anybody. All I have to go is do is, you know, get some casual labor, work for eight hours, get 40 or 50 bucks, go buy some drugs and maybe some cigarettes and do the same thing tomorrow. Like this is, you know, a, a small part of me thought that, but the part of me that knew that I wasn't, wasn't that person was going, Kelly, what are you doing, man? This is not the life that you deserve. And because I was finally left on my own, uh, because I was forced to do something, I, I, you know, got myself a referral into my, my third and final treatment center, which was a beautiful place um, up in, uh, uh, not Northern Ontario, but, you know, middle of Ontario, run by the Salvation Army. And I'll be forever grateful to the Salvation Army. They do some amazing work, but this thing was a six month program, cost me 50 bucks for six months to get in here and do that thing, right? And, you know, I was on some antidepressants when I went in there because I was feeling like shit, to be honest with you. But after I got in there and started doing some work, you know, working the 12 steps while the people came in and, and put on meetings in the rehab center and actually started to take recovery seriously and started to kind of see some hope in my future. I said to the doctor there, I said, what do you think about getting me off these antidepressants? I said, is it? And he said, yeah, he goes, okay, we can give you, we'll give you a try. He said, well, wean, We'll wean you off real, you know, slowly, like under a doctor's care, I got off these antidepressants and um, yet I didn't, I didn't need them. I'm, like I said before, I'm not, I'm not a clinically depressed guy. I'm just a guy who, you know, suffered with this untreated addiction. So, you know, I, I graduated from that place. If you want to say it that way after six months and managed to get about a year and a half of sobriety under my belt. And it was good. You know, I, I moved out to Niagara on the lake, which is just a beautiful little place um, in, uh, you know, near Niagara Falls in Ontario, nice little hotels and inns and things like that. And I got a job at a, a cool little boutique hotel. And I worked there for a couple months. And I can remember, though, you know, but I left my recovery back home. You know, I was going to, you know, 12 step meetings. And I know, you know, hey, listen, 12 step meetings aren't for everyone. And I totally get that. In my case, that's what that's what I, I what, you know what seemed to work for me, right? But I, I I left it behind. I didn't bother trying to make connections for where I moved. When I moved to Niagara on the Lake, I would go to a meeting a week and just sit and listen and not really talk to anybody. I was isolating and just not really doing much of my life except for working. But I can remember it was a beautiful. It had to be an eighty degree day. It was a Sunday afternoon. I'd finished work, and I had two days off coming up. You know, and I'm sitting there 
I quit smoking at this time as well. I'm feeling friggin' healthy. I mean, great. All that weight that I was carrying around for years, Jim, I lost all that weight. Right. And I'm starting to, I'm starting to feel like a human being and I'm just, I'm, I'm loving it. Right. You know, I had more money in the bank than I'd ever had before. Wasn't a ton at that time, but I was doing, I was doing well, but I wasn't doing anything as far as recovery. So I can remember sitting in the restaurant that night at the golf course and it just came over me. I, I go, I'm, I'm, I'm smoking crack tonight. I, I didn't, you know, cause it just snuck up on me after a year and a half of sobriety with having no, no alcohol, no drugs in my body. That's the thought that came to me because my life was still very, very small. I was isolated, had no program of recovery. And, and sure enough, I had to, I, as soon as I made that decision in my head, I ran to the bathroom because I, my body physically changed. And I'm like, Oh, I have to like my, I, my insides got so excited that I actually had to go to the washroom and, and take care of some business there. And I'm sure people listening can maybe understand the, just the thought of, using drugs can sometimes change our physiology and it's a crazy thing. And it just goes to show how, you know, powerless I am over, over the drugs. It changes me. And I hadn't even, didn't even know where I was going to get them yet. Yeah. But uh, you know what I mean? But uh, yeah, so I did. And I, and I, and I got them and that was 2008 and it took me another three years to find sobriety, but I'll tell you, I, I finally did find sobriety um, August 3rd, 2011. So I've been sober for, a little over 11 years now, man. And good for you, man. That's great. Thanks, man. Thank you. And uh, yeah, I mean, life has changed so much since I've, since I've, you know, done certain things, taken recovery seriously. And my, you know, a huge part of my recovery is actually living my life. It's sure. You know, what, whatever, whatever I choose to do as far as my program of recovery, that's awesome. Right. And that, that's got to, in my opinion, come number one for me anyway, because if I don't have sobriety, I don't really have much else. There's not really much I can build on. But I think what I was missing out on before was, yeah, I wasn't much of a risk taker. I wasn't much of a dreamer. Sorry, I was a dreamer. I wasn't much of a doer. I had great ideas. I want to be a millionaire, but I wasn't doing anything about it, you know? Yeah. So I found that a huge part of my recovery is, 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 is insisting that I get outside of my comfort zone and try things that scare me fail at things you know go ask go ask that girl out even though it makes you nervous and you might get rejected right that's something i was just deathly afraid of you'll notice that there are like no women in my life story before the before the my, you know the age of 30 something i mean there were but nothing serious because i just didn't feel worthy and you know recovery and and taking risks and, and risking rejection is something that's changed all that and uh you know like it's it it's it's a it's a really cool thing to think of you know i look at pictures of myself from i'm 49 now but i can i have this picture when i was checking into that that final treatment center back in 2008 when i was 35 years old and i looked like an old man and you know i'm not saying i look like i'm 25 or anything right now but i should i look a hell of a lot better than i did back then right yeah it's, it's, it's amazing what addiction addiction can just destroy you inside and outside mm -hmm. just destroys you mentally emotionally physically yep absolutely absolutely so you know from there i i guess you know there were certain things that i wouldn't do before that i started doing when I finally got sober. And one of the things was helping other people, right? You know, um, getting outside of myself, facing my fear of saying, okay, now I have a solution to addiction recovery, but I need to share that with people, right? And before I was like, I didn't have the confidence to do that. But, you know, I, I was told by someone I, I you know, uh, trust my, my sponsor and a lot of other people at the time, you, you, gotta, you gotta pay it forward. You have to help other people. So I started to do that. And I, and I really got a lot out of that. And I still do that as well. And I'm, and I'm happy to say that I still do that. I, you know, I went through the 12-step the recovery process. So I got to make amends to a lot of people that I had pissed off, that I had wronged. And some of those people were the people that I worked for, where HR was looking for me in, this, in the streets of Greenville, South Carolina. And, you know, because of making amends with them, yeah, I was able to use them as a reference for a job that I wanted to get because I ended up working for um, a large customer of theirs. And, you know, because of 
and my sobriety in the program I was working, I actually had to deal with those people after it was funny, you know, after I got sober uh, for years. And that was such a cool thing. And I was, I was actually really proud of myself when they would see me because I was a completely different person. You know, I was in, you know, I mean, I was in great shape, but I, you know, I, I still am, but you know, I was just happy that they got to see me that way. And, and, and it was a really cool thing. I'll tell you, sort of take you through my, you know, my work in the past uh, seven or eight years, which was, you know, that job I had was, was good, but it really wasn't something I was excited about, you know, was selling barcoding equipment, nothing, nothing wrong with that. It's just not, it's not really for me, you know, wireless networking stuff didn't excite me. So me and a, a good friend of mine decided to start um, a landscaping company. I didn't know shit about landscaping, but he did. And I'm, you know, you know, I had a pretty good business mind. So we started this amazing landscape, this landscaping company. And so I was with him, I guess, for about five years and we built this business. And so that was kind of something cool. You know, if he had told me, you know, 10 years before that, that I would be a business owner, it wouldn't have made, it wouldn't have made sense to me because I didn't see myself as a worthy person that got to run a business. I just didn't think I knew how to do that stuff. I wasn't good at life, but here we were doing it, you know? Uh, from there, I opened another uh, a renovation company. So I was doing, working with tools and, and, you know, installing floors and painting and building walls and stuff. I'd never done that before. So I learned so much in recovery. Right? We made some good money doing it as well. And, um, but, you know, that's, that, that stuff is great, but it's, it, it's not for me. It, it's, 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 it, I'm so happy I tried all that stuff because that's kind of that stuff that was getting me outside of my comfort zone, risking um, you know, failure. And, and I think that was so important for me to actually risk, risk failure, right? To, uh, I know Tony Robbins, I love that guy. He, he, he says that, uh, you know, the quality of my life is based amount, based on the amount of uncertainty that I can handle. And I, and I totally agree. And, and that statement really uh, rings true to me, right? Uh, that's why I like to do things that I'm not completely confident about, you know, I, you know, I now work in, the addiction recovery industry, right? So I work with people one-on-one -on -one, um, to take them through the recovery process, not like a paid sponsor, don't get me wrong, but like a recovery coach. And, 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 and you know, that's something that I really enjoy doing. So I had to take a step back from where I was and realize that I really wanted to work with people in um, where, where I was. And one of the things that, you know, I, my experience have seen in the rooms of recovery were a lot of people getting sober and and stopping at sobriety and you know let's you know doing a lot of fellowship and i'm going to you know i'm going to five six meetings a week and oh yeah that stuff's great jim don't get me wrong and i'm not saying people shouldn't go to meetings but i saw so many people forgetting to get a life for themselves forgetting to say okay step back what do i want to do with my life do i want to move out of this little you know, studio basement apartment or whatever, or am I content here for the rest of my life? So um, in my own life, I decided to dream bigger. And so, you know, I took a bunch of courses, I read a bunch of books and, and, you know, I now realize that my, where I am today is based on where I think I'm going to be in the future. If I think I'm going to have a, a really successful and exciting and happy future, well, then Today, I'm going to have hope, but if I don't plan ahead and have an idea of where I want to go and I'm, I'm not excited about that, then today's kind of wasted, right? And so that, that's, that's something that I've learned in recovery, right? I needed a clear head to learn that, but if I don't have goals for my future, my sobriety doesn't really mean all that much. And I think you know, sobriety is obviously the greatest gift, but the fact that whatever program that we are, we choose to work, um, as long as it works for us, it's the opportunity to live a life beyond that program, I think is the greatest gift of, of whatever program it is. You know what I mean? No, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Because I think, I, mean, I, think having, a life I was going to say having a fellowship is so important. It really is to have uh, like-minded individuals that you can speak to, mm -hmm. and yep, absolutely, and really, they when you speak with them, they get you. You, you, you at least have that feeling. They understand where I'm coming from. They've been there, 
Because sometimes you talk to someone, you know, it could be your mom, your dad, or whoever they're interested, they want to talk to you. They don't, you, you say to yourself, I'm not even going to explain certain things or try to, because they just won't get it. Right. You know? Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and nor should they, right? Because they, they just, they're not, they don't. They've never been there. <laughs> they don't get it. Yeah, yeah. man. And they that's cool. That's cool. But, you know, thank God for those people that put up with our shit for so many years, though, right? That, that don't know about this disease, but they still stood, stood by me anyway. Yeah. I can speak for myself. But, man, they, honestly, I mean, you know, it's, it's great that people like us can get sober. But the people who stand by us and put up with our shit and don't give up on us, and I think they're the real heroes. You know what I mean? Yeah, absolutely. It's, they are. They're the lifesavers. Absolutely, man. Yeah, you know, a lot of them give us the reason to keep to first and foremost get sober and a reason to stay sober. You're you got that right, man. Re yeah. Relationships. Yeah, for me personally, I don't want to let my mom down. So that's always in the back of my mind. Uh, and I don't want to let my daughter down. So that's also in the back of my mind. I want her to only grow up knowing a sober dad. Mm -hmm. I'll tell her the stories when she's old enough, but I'm never going to. I'm hoping to never be that guy again. I'm with you, man. That's so great, Jim. That's amazing to hear. Yeah. Amazing to hear. And so again, towards the end here, did you, um, so what are you doing nowadays? Like what's life like for you? How do you, yeah. how do you keep yourself sober? You know, so I still go to meetings, not as many as I used to. So, you know, I to do much more recovery. Right. And yeah. I, Help take other people through the work as well. So I sponsor people. That's kind of, that's what I do with my, you know, with my actual, I don't know if you want to call it the recovery portion, but you know, so much has changed where, you know, I think because I was my whole life, I was overweight and I, I hated that. I just hated it. And it caused me so much. So I took up fitness when I, when I got sober finally, and I started running and going to the gym, but I really took the running and I love it. And, um, so I, you know, I quit smoking when I was in my last rehab center. So I can actually, I can actually run upstairs now, which is amazing because I smoked for 20 years and I know um, I would not be able to do what I'm doing today if I was continuing to, to smoke cigarettes too. But um, so, you know, today I'm a marathon runner and I, and I absolutely love that. And I have a whole running community, whether it's back home in Canada, I'm in New York city right now, um, which is another freaking gift of gift of recovery as well. Uh, I'll tell you about that in a second, but you know, being a part of a, a fellowship of like-minded people like you were talking about, but not necessarily in a, in a recovery room. So I have a lot of friends that are runners and, and we run together and we, we have that in common. You know, we just, we just ran the Chicago Marathon uh, earlier this month, me and um, 10 or 12 friends, which was amazing, you know, and I can remember, I remember running the Las Vegas Marathon a few years ago. And I always get goosebumps when I'm there because I'm thinking of myself as, as homeless shelter Kelly, you know, 10, 12, 13 years ago going, man, like what, not how did this happen? Because I know what happened, but like, how, how cool is this that I'm sitting after racing the, the Las Vegas marathon, I'm outside watching the Bellagio fountains go off and I'm just sitting here taking everything in with 40,000 other runners, right? It brings a tear to my eye. And I just love that, um, that I'm healthy enough to do that. And so, so, you know, that is, that is really cool. So um, I have an, an amazing, I told you, you know, we lost my dad five years ago. However, I got to be his son for six years before he died. Right. And I'm so grateful for that because I was sober. I was part of the family. I had put him through so much. I'm sure I shaved a few years off the poor man's life just with my behaviors. Right. Um, and, and by the way, I, I talked about him earlier. He, he did quit drinking like 25, 30 years ago. He just stopped like that. So he, oh, he also man. died sober. Yeah, yeah. Um, so we have that. So I have a great relationship with my with uh, my mom and my sister and her family, right? I get to be there uh, and a part of the family, which is amazing. And it's, you know, it, working a program of recovery, one of the things that I hear people constantly talk about is, is family and how families can be rebuilt. It doesn't always happen, but, um, you know, relationships that are recovered as a result of people getting sober and working working a solid program of recovery is just, just awesome. Yeah. So, you know, so I do that. I, I love staying in shape, right? And I, you know, I'm, uh, you know, I, I got to run the New York city marathon last year, which was a, a dream of mine. Right. And 
Dude, I, 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 and I, I finished in the, in the, in the top 10% of the field. And I, and I look at that and I go, how, what are you like? This is amazing. You know, that is, that's absolutely amazing. That yeah. Really thanks is. dude. Thanks man. Good for you. You know, from, from that guy who I couldn't stop smoking crack. I could just couldn't stop smoking crack. And now I get to be in New York city and, and run, run a full marathon and, 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 and do really well too, you know? So I decided this year that I was going to come back to New York. So I made a plan in January and this is all part of my, you know, I actually plan ahead now to do stuff that I want to do. So I plan starting January that I was going to come here to New York city um, for the summer. And so I've been here since June and uh, I'm actually leaving uh, next week and head back home. But, you know, I get to spend five months in New York city, uh, you know, which is honestly, dude, my favorite place on earth. I just absolutely love this city. I love everything about it. It's totally my vibe, you know, yeah. I get to do all this, all this stuff sober. I can remember the first time I came here was back in the late nineties. I came with a couple of friends that I'd met and they, they both worked for the Hilton hotel. So they said, Hey, come to New York. Um, we, we got a, a nice hotel room through the Hilton. And so, yeah, okay. So, you know, I was still, of course, heavily drinking at the time, right? And there were three of us and me and the one person, all we wanted to do was spend time at the Irish, Irish pub. And that's pretty much all we did for the entire five or six days. And I remember the one girl saying, oh, but I wanted to see Central Park. And I was like, why, why would you, who cares? Like, what, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, you know, today, I don't understand that guy back then, you know, as, as that guy back on then wouldn't understand the guy I am now because we're two completely different people. Yeah. Um, and it's such a, it's such a nice thing to be able to look back and not, you know, not only see the change, but also use that to, you know, help other people. So I'll be, I'll be heading back to Toronto next week and I'm going to continue to do new and exciting things in my new life and my new business and just, you know, just enjoy my recovery and help others as much as I possibly can, man. It's pretty good. It's pretty sweet. Sounds like you're doing good. Happy for Thanks, you. Thanks, man. Thanks, Jim. So again, towards the end here, did you have anything else you want to add in? Huh, that's a good question. I, for me in recovery, I think the most important, you know, if I were to tell someone brand new that's never been to a recovery meeting or knows much about addiction in general is that, you know, once we get sober, that's just the beginning. And I'm sure we've all heard that before, but in a good way, not that life gets super hard, but that's the point where we can say, Hey, we have been given the gift of sobriety. Now, what are you going to do with that gift? Are you going to take it and accept a mediocre life? Or are you going to realize that you are an absolute warrior? You're a legend because you actually were able to do the impossible and get yourself sober with help, obviously. Are you going to take that strength and just stop? Or are you going to take that strength and build a life for yourself beyond that of what you could possibly imagine right now? And I think for me, that's the biggest gift of, of sobriety. And I think everyone who's you know, in recovery or is contemplating recovery should know that there is so much, our world can get so much bigger. Our lives can get so much bigger. People go back to school, people get married, have kids, start businesses, do all sorts of cool stuff. Uh, but not everyone does that. So that's, that'd be my message for anyone who, who, who might be, I don't know, struggling or not, not quite sober yet. Just realize the opportunity for an amazing life that lies ahead. If you choose to use that strength that you do have inside you carry that forward and doing things that you, that you really want to do. It's great advice. That is absolutely Thanks. great advice. I really appreciate that. All right. So I really want to say thank you so much for coming on the podcast today. How do you feel? I feel great, man. I feel great. I really, I really, uh, I really enjoyed this. I enjoyed our chat, even though I did most of the chatting, but I really appreciate the opportunity, Jim. This was awesome. And, yeah, and, you know, th thank you for doing what you do, man, with, with Addicts Anonymous and, and what you put together. And I think it is just so amazing that people like yourself are inspiring others by, by, you know, by changing things up a little bit and realizing that, hey, you know, recovery is for everybody. Everyone deserves recovery. And, exactly. and they're, you know what I mean, dude? No one needs to be left out.
and, exactly. and, and I and there, see guys and there's like just different people. options. One option's not better than the other. It's just yep. one's going to fit for you, or you two it. could fit for you. There are people who do two different programs. Okay, you know, so just whatever works. And I just want to provide a you know another alternative. Damn right, man. I really appreciate <laughs> that. I think you're doing well, man. Great. Thank you. I appreciate that. All right, my friend, sit tight for me. For everybody watching and listening, if you like what you saw and heard, go below and give us a like. Also, subscribe to see when we upload new videos. You can check us out on Twitter, Reddit, Instagram, TikTok, Facebook, pretty much all social media platforms. I also suggest checking out our website, which is www.addicts-anonymous.com. There you will find plenty of resources as well as free literature. I hope you enjoyed today. That's all we have. And until next time.